Welcome, everybody, to the last community session of the uh, track session of the reInvent. Um, my name is Christian Melendez. I work for Equinix in the, pro the professional services. We help companies in the onboard journey to have a better performance in their networking and hybrid uh, clusters and uh, applications in, the, in case they need to have um, interconnected uh, environments. I also founded the user group in Guatemala, the Latin America group in Spanish, and I'm co-founding, I'm co-organizing the meetup in Madrid, so um, I have the opportunity to talk uh, with a lot of members uh, of the community, and um, every time that we talk about AWS, we learn something new, even the ones that are sharing the, their knowledge. But I also work for uh, fraud, that, well, I mean, for um, insurance um, consultancy company, we work for the top five insurance companies in the U.S. And uh, the system that we were working for it was about uh, finding who should be paying the insurance claims that customers were doing because there were times where users were claim, putting some claim, insurance claims there and they needed to, to make sure who, who is the, the responsible of, of paying that. So we needed to, to not just react fast, but we have to uh, be pretty sure if the information that we had there was accurate and was the one that we thought that is going to be useful for, for the company that was uh, using our software. So it is not just about um, what fraud detection is a, a, mil a billion business uh, nowadays and in is increasing every day. So it is um, an adaptive process that you need to continue learning, that you need to iterate, that you need to keep working on them. You cannot say that you're done with uh, when you find out the fraud. You need to keep going because there are, going to, there are going to be always new things or new ways to hack the system, as with everything, right? So um, let me take you through some theory, some concepts about fraud detection, and then we're going to keep talking about... Um, how can, you do, how, how can you build fraud detection systems using AWS Batch and, of course, containers? So it is not about just banks or it's not just about credit cards. Uh, there are other use cases uh, where you can apply fraud detection. So um, let me see your hands. How many of you are working with fraud detection systems? Okay, cool. So you're, you're, you're with me, right? It is not just about banking, it is not just about uh, uh, credit cards or things like that. I've heard that if we have a, um, I heard a story that there's a company there that is using fraud detections for a biking, um, when, for biking rentals, where they need to find out if um, someone is not trying to steal the, the bike or the scooter that they just rented, or if it's um, the person that they are going to rent the bike or the scooter is the person that is going to return that, right? So they're gonna, there, there are a lot of other use cases where you can apply fraud detection. So it is not just about um, credit cards or for banking. There are use cases where you don't, you don't need to react fast um, and promptly in real time, but you have to be really precise on, on, on what are your uh, decisions on, on how to detect fraud. So. Fraud detections works better with structured data. When you have structured data, you can easily take decisions there because you already um, have the information that you have. You have run some cleanup of, of for the data. You have everything that, that you need there. So you're not going to be including um, a, 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 any noise there. So it is better if you have structured data because usually you take data or you read data from different sources. It is about a continuous learning. You cannot stop. You cannot stop there and, and say that you, uh, you're done there. Um, I mean, you, you need to continue um, finding new ways or understanding the, the data that you are collecting from all of your systems. It is not easy just because of that, because you, you cannot say that you're done. You need to continue finding new ways of, um, I mean, to, to, to interpret the data that you are collecting with, um, with your systems. So. As I said before, you need to react fast and promptly, even though there are systems that where you don't need to have that ability, but usually that's the, the, the concept, because, because remember that it is a one billion business nowadays and it's increasing every day, so you need to react, um, I, I mean, at, at the proper time. 
because if not, you're going to be uh, ending losing a lot of money. So for fraud detection, there are four um, analysis methods that you can implement or that you usually, I mean, or the industry usually um, applies to these type of systems. There are the knowledge discovery database where you actually just collect the data that you are going to be using. You just collect the data that you need, that you think that you're going to need to build the, the roles or the algorithm that will detect that there is actually fraud in, in the data that you, are, that, that, you, that you have. There's also the data mining process where you need to find, where you are going to find patterns of the data that you are collecting. You're gonna, after you collected that data, you're gonna understand, you're gonna find out if there are um, some use cases or some data that you think this, that could look like a fraud. So th there's also the, those type of analysis that you could be applying. And of course, uh, once you are there, once you find out which are the patterns that you're gonna be um, applying or using, you have um, a machine that is going to be learning about how to, uh, because you're gonna be having the base of the, of the, of the problem or the, or the fraud, and you're gonna be using machine learning to, to continue adapting to that. There's also statistic methods where um, you're going to be using, for example, the average time of, um, of the number of requests, insurance claims that people is doing and things like that. But those are just um, rules. Those are just numbers that if you don't give the information or if you don't give them the purpose that you are trying to detect a fraud, they're going to be meaningless. So... One, one of those examples where you need to apply a statistic data analysis is, as we were talking before, you need to prepare a fixed data. Usually that's the first process that you are uh, actually going to run every time that you are collecting and treating with, with your data. Um, it is not just like if, it is not as simple sometimes as just uh, extracting, transform, and loading ETL processes. Usually you will need to um, imp implement more complex um, uh, algorithms there or more processes there. You're gonna need to work with average number of requests. You're gonna have to work with numbers. You're gonna ha have to work with uh, um, um, distributions. You have to work with uh, percentiles and things like that. More information that, I mean, more different ways or different ways to interpret that data. You're gonna need to have a cluster and classification every time that you have the data. You need to find out where, where which data is gonna be useful for what. So it, it is useful to, because you're gonna be collecting data from all other sources. So it is useful if, I mean, it is helpful if you have that cluster and classification of the data. Um, finally, if, I mean, next, if you have that information, they're just gonna be able to detect anomalies in, in the data that you are collecting, that your systems are collecting. And one of the ways or the services that you could be using for, for AWS, I mean, AWS will offer you a lot of services where you can uh, start applying these um, statistic anal data analysis methods. So you will have, for example, you traditionally would use AWS Lambda, EC2, uh, Amazon Athena to query the data in a serverless way. You will have, um, you, you could be using Amazon um, uh, Kinesis, for example, to process the data in real time. Um, for storage, for, for storage, you will have, uh, you, you could be using S3. And we're gonna take a look to some um, few architecture ideas or few diagrams that I have for you here where uh, everything will uh, make sense there. So how does um, all of these services look like uh, in action? Well. I, I wanted to use the, the, the example of the Alpha Lambda architecture because I think that it represents very well what we are trying to, to, to achieve here with fraud detection. Because remember, there are gonna be times where you're not gonna be using only uh, real-time data or uh, you're gonna be just not processing data in real time and detect fraud. And as soon as you have the data there, uh, again, there are going to be systems where, like, for example, the insurance claims that I was talking before, they need to find out if, uh, I mean, the, the, the record history from the, 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 the customer, how uh, good is he, how well is he doing on that, if he, if, I mean, is, is, if it's not risky to pay that bill because uh, he's been doing that for, for several times, for example. But um, even though we have a lot of these cool services, there's one service in particular there that we need to, to take care of, and those are 
um, EC2 instances. Even though this looks like we have a serverless architecture, we will still have tho those um, type of uh, problems, not problems, but you need to take care of that. And you usually will install there something to uh, orchestrate the jobs, to orchestrate the, the, the task that will gonna help you to, to detect the, the fraud system. So um, we're gonna take a look to that in, in a more detail um, uh, as in, in, a, in, a, in another slides. But let me talk to you about some usually open source tools that the industry is using, and I bet that maybe some of you are already using some of these tools. We have a, um, Apache Samsa, we have Spark, we have Apex, we have Apache Storm, and we have Apache Flink. Personally, I have used uh, Apache Storm, and I started to, to use uh, uh, Apache Spark a few years ago when I was working with that uh, company that I mentioned. And, and I find out that uh, maybe it was because um, there were enough information from, for example, from Apache Spark, or maybe it wasn't that mature at that, uh, at that moment, but it was so hard to configure that, it was so hard. I mean, I spent up more time trying to understand the tool, trying to understand how to build something, before I could actually do something, if we, before actual, actually I could did, uh, build the algorithm, build the, the decision tree that, I'm, that I was going to be using or, or team was, were going to be using to detect the fraud that, uh, that we were talking about. But um, even, even these type of tools, they, for example, I can speak for Apache Storm and Apache Spark, they are actually implementing the Lambda architecture, they have the batch processing layer, and they have the speed layer. So you could be applying those, the, I mean, uh, Lambda architecture by using these type of tools, and Apache Spark is doing actually micro-batching processing. So the, the, the thing is that if these tools are actually doing that, why shouldn't we be doing, uh, why we shouldn't be doing um, using batch processing, right? So let's, let, let's talk about a little, a little bit about batch processing on where I think or where, I, where uh, I've seen that where you need to apply, where you need still to apply batch processing, even though you have now machine learning, even though you have now um, uh, real-time data. There is a time, there is a, a moment where you still need to have uh, to, to, to keep working with batch processing. So, but, but maybe, maybe uh, instead of saying just you need to, or there, there are some cases, um, let me show you some of the things that usually you need to keep doing with, I mean, to, 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 do, to do with batch processing. The first thing that you need to, I mean, if you are already working with fraud detection systems, you know that there is also pre-work needed. At, and especially for this type of, of, of technologies where you have uh, at least once delivery. One example of that was the first version of the AWS SQS where they didn't guarantee you the, the order, uh, I mean, the order, uh, not just the order, but they say that it doesn't, at least we're gonna deliver once the message to, uh, to the queue. And I had this problem also with um, Kinesis where I needed to, to run a batch processing job to clean up the data because there were times that I have duplicated data. And duplicated data when you are trying to understand patterns and things like that is just noise. You need to get rid of that. You need to work for that. So just by having this problem at least once delivery, now you could say that I, I, need, I need to have something to, 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 to get rid of that, to process that. So start with batch processing. Don't worry if you are not, if you, if you think that, even, in, even if you are working with uh, uh, projects or um, industries where actually machine learning and fraud detection, uh, I mean, on real-time processes are gonna be needed because you need to react fast and promptly, start with batch processing. You need to understand first. Complex analysis will need more data, like I was saying before with the example of the insurance claims, where usually they need to uh, review other type of information before actually giving a response to the customer. So there are, there are going to be complex analyses where different type of sources need to be consulted. High accuracy first, then um, learn how fraud detection looks like. This is gonna be the, 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 the advice that I'm gonna present for you uh, throughout this talk, and why you need to have, uh, why you need to, to, to start using 
batch processing because, as I said before, there are going to be use cases where you need to be, um, uh, um, I mean, to, to have the, the, the level of, of accuracy that you're going to need is higher than the, the speed that you're going to be needing uh, to, to process the data. So you're going to also be able to test multiple hypotheses. At the same time, you're going to be able to run A-B tests. You're going to be able to, uh, even, even if you already have something running, you could be applying even um, some techniques that you usually use for continuous delivery deployments, for example. You could be using um, a, a blue-green deployments and things like that. But because you are already using one source to, for the data, to collect the data and to work with uh, and, and trying to detect a fraud, you're going to be able to, to, to test multiple hypotheses. And because of that, we're going to take a look to which, of, uh, which are the, the, the techniques and the technologies that you could be using for that. So you will also be able to troubleshoot by going back in time. So all of these actions and all of these processes that you actually need when working with batch processing are going to be uh, included in the, this service, AWS Batch. Uh, so, but, but again, you're, you're going to still be needing um, real-time machine learning processes. So wh what should we be doing now then? Well, to work with AWS Batch, you need to uh, uh, start with what you already have. You don't have to worry about recreating everything. You don't have to worry about um, the working with the scheduler. You just need to focus on what you are developing. And we're going to take a look. We're going to take a recap uh, to what AWS Batch is in case you are not aware of that. But uh, I want to share with you some techniques or some uh, uh, strategies that usually come from the development side of the uh, um, development world where I uh, find the, those techniques really useful. So. In order to work with batch processing, and if you are going to do the transition to machine learning processes, try to use some patterns and, and do not try, to, I mean, avoid the temptation of getting rid of what you already have and forget about that and try to uh, deliver something new and work with a Greenfield project, for example. You could be, uh, start, you could start working or you continue working with um, your Brownfield project, right? So. In order, in order to do that, you could use the strangle pattern, which is the uh, a pattern commonly used in the development industry, where you will be building the new version of the system around the edges of the old system, and at some point you will strangle the old system, but you're going to be that in an iterative process. So you could be uh, simply, uh, you could easily start using batch processing and go to machine learning, but by doing that, step by step. So what you, you're going to be doing is that you're going to keep doing what you're doing. You're going to continue using what you already have. You're going to continue using um, the processes that you already have there. For example, usually you will have, um, I don't know, the simplest way to run a, a batch processing job is by having a, a cron job, for example. So you could be uh, keep using that part, and but we're going to um, uh, get rid of the problems of scaling by using this type of services. And as I said before, you're going to be able to run tests in parallel, uh, seeing data streams. In case you are going to, uh, you decide to continue working with what you have with batch processing, you're going to be able to stream the data to something else and work with machine learning processes. Run A-B testing, as I was saying before too, and you're going to be able to compare the results so that later you can refine and uh, choose uh, the best option or the best decision tree that you will be using for your uh, fraud detection algorithm. So going, uh, continue with, um, with the topic, we have containers. So um, the, the, the title of the topic included AWS Batch with Containers, and I'm not including containers just because um, everybody is talking about containers, so uh, or everybody is saying that containers are cool and we should be using containers for everything. That's not the case here. I want to show you, I want to explain with you why I think for this type of uh, problems, for fraud detection algorithms, containers are a really good option. And especially when we're working with, with uh, batch processing. Um, with containers, you will be able to have the, the, everything that 
you might already know about having isolation processes, having uh, uh, be, being able to run what you already have in your computer, in another computer, in another environment. But, but what is useful in, in, this, in this case is that you could use containers by um, applying, by repeating, by reducing what you already have. Uh, and, and again, we're just applying the same principles that we learned or that, that the industry learned from the, the development um, processes or strategies to work with containers. So there, the, I'm not sure if you are familiar with um, design patterns in software development, but there is a book that Brendan Borst, the co-founder of Kubernetes, wrote uh, a few months ago where he's talking about container design patterns. And one of the patterns that you will find there is the work queue pattern. And I found that interesting because um, when working with the, the, uh, the work queue or batch processing, this is the simplest way, the, the simplest solution or perspective that you could be using to solve a batch processing problem. And this is gonna be covering just like the general conception of work queue pattern, which is really simple, right? So you will have there um, work, work items that are gonna be sending, that are gonna be sent to the work queue manager. And that work queue manager is gonna be able to, uh, or the purpose of that work queue manager is to schedule those work items into um, workers that are, are gonna be processing the data in parallel. So as simple as that, but the thing is that you could be using this pattern to reduce and to split the problem in smaller, pro in smaller problems, a big problem in smaller problems, by starting to solve little by little. So the first, the first section that we're gonna be um, uh, abstracting or removing from that diagram that, uh, that you're seeing here is the work human manager. So with containers, you will be able to work with um, Every, every box, the two boxes that you see there, each of them is a, a container, a container image or container instance, for example. And the work queue manager container will be something that you will build uh, for a generic solution. That will be, uh, for example, an NPI, API endpoint that your applications will consume. And it doesn't matter what you have underneath that solution or that implementation, your the software that is using the work queue or the, or the queue system, they're gonna, it's gonna be agnostic for them. So think of it like it's, this will be an interface if you are working, if you are used to, to, to software development terms. The other container is gonna be the implementation of, of that interface. So what you, what you will have here is that you don't need to break the interface, you don't need to break the contract every time that you need to change something in the implementation of the queue pattern. So for example, in case you need to change the engine of the queue or, or, or the solution or the tool that you're using for the queue uh, system, that could be, for example, AWS SQS, Kinesis, or it could be RabbitMQ, it doesn't matter. You're gonna be able to, to, to create a, a reusable image or a reusable endpoint in the, in, the, in the first container that you see here that you could be using in another places of, of the system. And then you will be able to, uh, by using another pattern, the ambassador pattern, create the, the implementation of that solution. So, that, but that's the first part. That's like the queue manager, and that could be everything as 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 you as you need to uh, to to use. The other section is the worker uh, item, which is um, I, I would say that this is the, the the most important part of the pattern, where you need to create a container that will be able to. Um, process the data or the work items that you are receiving in your system. So these type of uh, problems, for example, uh, when you are working with containers and, and by using this pattern, the interesting thing here is that if you think in advance that you're gonna be using these type of systems, and trust me, I must say that because I've seen that some in, when developers or when uh, other companies are creating these type of solutions, they don't think ahead about when you are working with batch processing, you need to be able to parallelize workers. And with containers, you could be able to run something pretty standard and that you could be um, changing by changing the, 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 the environment variables, for example. And we're gonna be, uh, you're gonna be able to change the behavior of the container based on that configuration. So 
even though it, it sounds really simple, I've seen that not many companies or not many people is applying this principle of um, having uh, parallel workers and with containers, you, you're gonna be building just one image, just that. When, when you think about that, you're gonna be, uh, I mean, you could be saying, I, mean, I need to work in parallel uh, for these processes, so I need to build the scheduler, I need to build something that is gonna be able to process that uh, in parallel, but with containers, you're gonna be able to just focus on that, and it doesn't matter how many times you need to run processes like, or, or tools or services like AWS Watch or the Queue Manager will be able to take care of that. And that's basically the pattern that I, that I wanted to share with you. And these type of patterns or these type of problems were, uh, I mean, it's, it's not something new. AWS also had uh, the diagram of uh, how to work with uh, batch processing with the technologies that they had at the moment. Remember that I was talking before about using uh, EC2, AWS Lambda, and things like that. So a long time, a, a long time ago, they had these type of architectures where you, you're gonna be uh, using EC2 instances, you're gonna be scaling based on the work items that you have in the queue with your auto-scaling groups, but you needed to keep work, I mean, you, it, it was your responsibility to take care of everything there. So you can see there that there are a lot of pieces there that you need to take care before actually doing something, actually trying to uh, run batch jobs at scale. So for that, we have, uh, or they, 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 we have the, this option now of AWS Batch. Um, just to, just in, in case, uh, I mentioned this before, just in case you're not aware of what AWS Batch is, let's do a recap. Because even though it, it sounds like really simple, it is a really powerful um, uh, tool there, uh, uh, service there. First thing is that AWS Batch is a free managed job scheduler. You don't pay anything for using AWS Batch. Uh, what's under the hood of AWS Batch is ECS. And if you are already working with ECS, you will find um, this type of service is very helpful. And the learning curve is not that big, uh, even though the documentation is still growing. There are a lot of other um, blog posts out there, and there are a lot of other companies that are already using AWS Batch and they are working in, in tools or a wrapper of things that are, gonna, are, are actually making these type of services even better. You are, going to, you are able to launch EC2 instances when you need. This is like a, like a big catch for AWS Batch because remember that I was saying in the diagram that we were seeing before, you had the auto-scaling groups that they were growing based on the, working, the work items that you have in the queue. Well, AWS Batch will grow at, scale, at the scale that you need based on the work items that, or the jobs that you are submitting to the service. So you don't need to worry about that. Even if you need to have customized AMIs or that if you need to install something or if you, if you need to use um, EFS um, a file system, for example, you could be uh, using, uh, you could be customized, you could customize that part. So, AWS Batch, which will launch the instances that you need. And the good thing is that when the, the workers are, are done by, with processing the, the work items, AWS Batch will turn off those instances. And AWS Batch can decide which type of instances are gonna be using based on the containers that, that you are configuring in, in the service. Because of that, AWS Batch is aware or knows how many instances you're gonna be needing uh, on, the, on the memory or the CPU reservation that you had for that container. If you are worried uh, about uh, how to save some money, you could also be using uh, spot instances there. But again, this is not like, this sounds like it is something new or is something like uh, we, don't ha we didn't have that before, but because this is under the hood, AWS Batch is using ECS, we already had that with, with that service. So even though it is cool, we, it, it, they, your, their AWS Batch is just a wrapper or, a, or, a, or, a, or they are offering you a new way of working with batch processing. Because all of, all of these type of, of tasks, you could be creating that in, in, in ECS, right? But AWS Batch is just another layer. So you just need to learn how to use it. 
Uh, it is integrated because it is integrated with ECS, it is integrated with BPC, so you could be working perfectly in a private environment there. You don't need to um, worry about that the, this is gonna be used uh, outside uh, of your network and because so we, because we're, when we are talking about fraud detection, this is pretty important that, that the information that you have there is not, um, um, pub, uh, in, uh, is not public by, by mistake. The, the cool thing is also that you have multiple queue, uh, job queues uh, with priorities. You could be configuring complex environments there where you uh, could be using, uh, for, for a certain type of queue, you could be configuring use these um, on-demand instances and for another queue for your free tire users, for example, or for uh, the, the, the hypothesis or the A-B A/B test that you're running, use spot instances, for example, because you are just trying to, to see how everything works, so you could be using um, uh, multiple job queues there with uh, priorities, and each queue will have a different instance type. And there are some gotchas that I, that I want to share with you because um, the first time that I used this service, the, these gotchas weren't that obvious for me, and, and I found that really useful that if someone could have shared that with me before, I, I think that I could be having um, a cluster, IWS batch cluster running in minutes. The first thing is that, and the most important I, I would say is that in compute resources, BCPUs is not the same as CPU units. And because I have the theory of um, AWS batch is similar to ECS, the first thing that I, that I thought that when I was configuring the, the, the job definition, which is like a uh, ECS task definition, I thought that, um, well, for compute resources, it's the same, right? Uh, I'm gonna configure how much, uh, how, how many BCP units, uh, I, I mean CPU units I needed for the container, but it's not the same. So in computer resources, the BCP use is actually the, the virtual CPUs that you're gonna be needing for, for that uh, cluster. So you just define that. Uh, in job definitions, do not use CPU units because again, even though it is a task definition in ECS, it is not using CPU units. Because if you end up doing that, you're gonna, uh, uh, the, your jobs are have states, and your jobs are gonna be uh, stick in the runnable state, and you're you're gonna see that, and you're gonna wonder why it's not running, why it's not working, and trust me, <laughs> as it sounds really simple, this this is uh, if I if I have that if I should have if I have had that before, um, that would be really helpful. Um, the, the trigger for, for, for the queue or for the system is submitting a job call and it is pretty straightforward. Um, this is an example of how you will submit a job. Uh, you, could integrate it, you could integrate that in, in your uh, existing workload. You could be creating, for example, that uh, a, the container implementation of the container interface or the resource that you are using. Uh, you could be using um, any SDK that, that AWS supports. And the cool thing, because you have this, other companies are creating uh, support for AWS Batch or other projects like uh, uh, Pegasus WMS or, or the, the project that Spotify launched called Luigi. They already include support for AWS Batch by using this. So there are, uh, there are examples out there that you could int where you could see, uh, int see how AWS Batch integrates with um, this type of, uh, of frameworks out there. So um, the, let me show you a few architecture ideas on how can you start working with that because remember that we were already seeing that and it is pretty straightforward. Um, sadly, I cannot share with you uh, the names of any company because you know fraud detection is like really sensitive, not uh, anyone, I mean there are a few companies that are willing to share that information. So uh, I cannot get into the details, but um, I, I wanted to share with you some architecture ideas where you can apply this type of processes and where you can use, w that you could be using with other AWS services. So traditional batch processing with containers will look like this. You will have your users there uh, that are gonna be hitting the, 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 the environment or the resources that you have in, in the cloud. 
And the first thing, for example, that you, you could decide that you're going to be using AWS Kinesis. And Kinesis, with Kinesis, you, you could be having um, the batch layer. And with an AWS Lambda, you could be reading or consuming that data in micro batching, in a micro batching way. But the difference is that because uh, previously you had um, the timeout of, of Lambda functions of five minutes, now you have 15 minutes there. But at some point, you will always have a limit. It doesn't matter how much uh, time you have there. Even if there's a request that AWS Lambda could support more time, they're going to be always in batch processing uh, things that where you will need more time, where you will need that the, the, based on the work item that will scale. And even though you have uh, um, uh, a way to manage those limits in AWS Lambda, there's going to be always a limit. So you could be using AWS Lambda as a proxy to AWS Batch. And this is just an example, of course, uh, where, uh, what you can use to, 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 to interact with AWS Batch. Then the AWS Lambda will launch the submit job call to AWS Batch. And AWS Batch will basically receive everything uh, that you send, it doesn't matter how much or uh, oh, how, I mean, how many requests you send to, to, to AWS Batch, AWS Batch will receive that. And based on the work you, on the, on the load that it receives, it will create the, actually, the actual resource, uh, um, the EC2 resources there, based on the configuration that you previously had or had to create when you were creating the service. So, um, for example, the, it will create three instances, four instances, and, in, and if you configure everything correctly, it will start launching the instances. If not, AWS Batch, for example, will uh, verify that you don't have a soft limit of how many EC2 instances you, your account can launch. But because if you didn't configure that correctly, uh, AWS could end up saying that it will need 100 instances because of the workload that you are sending at the moment. And uh, I know that it sounds like uh, uh, AWS Batch won't, won't be, it scales dynamically. You need to be very careful on that part because uh, the, the first set of jobs that you send, if you didn't configure that correctly, AWS Batch will just have those, those jobs there. And even though AWS Batch offers um, uh, a retry um, option there, there are going to be some times where it's not going to work. So then uh, after you have the, the, the compute resources running, you could be sending that data to, AWS, to, to Amazon S3, for example, and you could be interacting, connecting the other AWS services with, with that. You could be uh, having um, S3 bucket where you are just sending uh, everything for, for a couple purposes is there. Um, you could be um, using the, the first bucket to have temporary data there and things like that. And then the data that you have there, you will be using something like Amazon Athena and Amazon QuickSight to, to review that data. So even though that looks like uh, 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 not that simple as it should be something, the, the, the secret sauce here is what you have in your containers. AWS Batch will take care of that, and it is pretty much a serverless architecture. So let's take a look at something, if you, uh, uh, a similar architecture, if you want to include uh, the real-time layer, for example. Because remember that we were talking about um, the Lambda architecture, not AWS Lambda. And we, also, we were also working about the strangler pattern. So again, you will have your users here, you will have your cloud here, and you will send that to Amazon Kinesis. And again, this, the difference will be that you will have the same as the previous one. You will have your batch layer, but now you will have your uh, speed layer. So this is, this is, this is where uh, the, the cool thing is, because you could be using another AWS Lambda to run another set of tests uh, by consuming the data that is arriving to Kinesis and you're going to be able to, to process that. And the same thing that you could be doing for the speed layer, you could be doing that for the batch layer. So it doesn't matter how many experiments you would like to run, but just using this type of services and uh, taking care of the container or the, the, the solution that you have, it will be enough. So again, you will be that, then connecting that with uh, Amazon S3, and you will be able to connect that with another services like uh, 
kinesis data firehose, for example, if you want to send that data to S3 or, or Redshift. And again, the same as the previous one, you will have something to, to, that will collect the unified information, and you will be consuming that with Athena and um, uh, graphically with QuickSight. So it looks like really simple, but this is like the, the, the solution that, that will work with if you are trying to move from batch processing to machine learning algorithms. And in, in case you are wondering how to focus only in machine learning algorithms, you could be working with, again, with, kin with kinesis. Um, you will have the lambda here. And then you will have batch. And batch will, again, will launch EC2 resources. And the cool thing about batch is that you, you could be working with these simple scenarios, but you could also work with um, array jobs where uh, you could create complex um, logic or complex processes there where everything, where one container will be um, uh, in charge of executing one phase of the pipeline that you need to run for processing the data, for example. So the, in that example is using um, uh, the first group will be a, a container, just uh, the container before the step one, and the second one will be uh, the container for the step two, and things like that. And then you could create the data um, that you are gonna, the structured data that you're gonna be using for your machine learning algorithms, and another services like SageMaker could be uh, consuming that data. So you will be, um, you, you won't include the, the data preparation in SageMaker, even though it is possible to do that, um, you could split the problems in, in, in different sections by using AWS Batch and by using containers. So wrapping up, um, le learn how FRAT looks. You need to understand that first in order to, to, to take a better decision. You need to understand the data and AWS, I mean, batch processing is gonna be the, the starting point for that. Um, Batch processing is still needed, or there are some cases where actually batch processing is the only way. So uh, if, that, if that's your case, and if you are um, okay by actually doing something and starting with something, you could be using um, AWS Batch for, for, for that matter. Um, you will be able to simultaneously run batch real-time and machine learning and create more complex scenarios, uh, but, but again, um, a batch processing and AWS batch will be the starting point for that. Don't reinvent the wheel. Use AWS batch or managed services or serverless services that you have in AWS batch. Even though that uh, some tools are really cool, like the, the tools that I mentioned before, um, do not try to get complex at the beginning, even uh, though if you need to do it, start simple, the, because the, the more interactive that you do the, that process, the better it will be for you to start learning and, and improving the, the solution. Uh, uh, and again, um, containers will help you to the re reduce the lead time. And just because you are working with, uh, uh, if you work, uh, you think ahead about um, the patterns and think ahead that you're gonna be using that to run multiple times, containers and AWS batch will be the solution for, uh, for, for you to reduce the lead time because that will be just a matter of pushing the, the, container, the new container version and you don't have to change anything in the job definition. You could be creating another queue, uh, queue in AWS batch that will be uh, using that job definition of the, of the container image. And you could be, uh, again, applying the same principles of uh, blue-green deployments, kernel releases, and things like that that have worked for um, continuous delivery pipelines. You could be applying the same principles um, when you are working with containers and AWS batch. Lastly, learn, adapt, and try again. So that was all. Thank you. Have a great time. <laughs>